China's grain imports increased dramatically this year. The authorities give a different reason from the farmers. The U.S. placed new sanctions on a Chinese citizen. This time, a crime group's leader is working with the Chinese communist regime to boost China's influence across the world. On International Human Rights Day, the U.S. is taking further action against religious persecution in China. A second major stock index cuts off the cash flow from U.S. investors to Chinese firms with ties to the country's military. And CCP infiltration in U.S. campuses. Two more U.S. colleges are found to have failed to report that they received million-dollar donations. These donations were linked to China. Welcome to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. First, we turn to China's food shortage. In the first 11 months of this year, China imported nearly 100 million tons of grain, marking a 30 percent increase year on year. According to China's customs data, in the first 10 months, corn imports exceeded 7 million tons. That's almost twice the amount imported last year. And from January to November, China's soybean imports increased by nearly 20 percent year-on-year. As for rice, China purchased around 100,000 tons from India. It marks the first time Beijing has imported rice from India in nearly 30 years. Chinese media attributed the jump in imports to other countries' low grain prices. Beijing has repeatedly denied the rising suspicions of a grain shortage in the country. But farmers across China tell us that severe flooding last summer and heavy rain during autumn led to poor grain harvests. Now we take a look at the outbreak of the CCP virus in China. Two cities in northern Chinese, Heilongjiang province, were locked down on Thursday after a couple of cases of the CCP virus were confirmed. The provincial outbreak response group announced wartime status for Dongning City and Shuifenhe City. A local resident in Dongning City told us all the communities and schools have been closed. Highways are also blocked. Vehicles from outside are not allowed to enter the city. An online video shows residents lining up to get what they can from the supermarkets. A reporter from NTD sister media The Epoch Times called the city center for disease control and prevention. The woman who answered the phone refused to answer any questions related to the pandemic. She told the reporter to read an official press release or contact the provincial outbreak response group. A shop owner in the city told us the authorities told her to close her shop. Authorities notified hotels that they could not receive guests from outside the city, but only take in local guests. A restaurant clerk said all communities in Dongning City have been put on lockdown and everyone is now at home and must go for testing later. Shuifenhe City was also shut down. Schools and neighborhoods there are closed. Only pharmacies and grain shops stayed open. Other shops were ordered to close as well. A restaurant clerk in the city told us the restaurant can only deliver takeout now. The U.S. on Wednesday slapped sanctions on a leader of China's 14K Triad Organized Crime Group and a member of the Chinese Communist Party's Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference. Flora Bradley Watson reports. The Trump administration has used its anti-corruption powers to slap sanctions on three men that include a Chinese crime boss. The measures announced on Wednesday targeted Wang Kuo Koi, a leader of China's 14K Triad organized crime group, as well as a top Liberian politician and a former senior Kyrgyz official. Under the sanctions, all of their property and companies that fall under U.S. jurisdiction will be frozen. Widely known as Broken Tooth, Wang has close ties to China's Communist Party, and is accused of using his companies to try to paper over illegal criminal activity under the guise of China's large infrastructure strategy, the Belt and Road Initiative. Criminal allegations against Wan include drug trafficking, illegal gambling, racketeering and human trafficking. The U.S. Treasury also targeted three entities owned or controlled by Wan, based in Hong Kong, Cambodia and Palau. A senior U.S. official said the measures were part of a broader campaign against corruption, which has seen sanctions imposed on more than 200 people since 2017. It's International Human Rights Day. To mark it, the Trump administration sanctioned a Chinese official for persecuting Falun Gong practitioners. It's the first time the United States has punished a Chinese official for persecuting the spiritual group. The State Department is sanctioning a Chinese official for human rights violations against Falun Gong practitioners. Falun Gong, also known as Falun Dafa, is a spiritual practice that's persecuted by the Chinese regime. 
Secretary of State Mike Pompeo says the U.S. will deny entry to Huang Yuanxiong and his wife. Huang is a police chief in the southern city of Xiamen. Pompeo said Huang is associated with particularly severe violations of religious freedom of Falun Gong practitioners, namely his involvement in the detention and interrogation of Falun Gong practitioners for practicing their beliefs. The State Department sanctioned 17 foreign officials on Thursday, including Huang. The Chinese regime has been persecuting Falun Gong for over two decades. Millions have been detained, and there are over 4,000 documented deaths, although experts say the true figure is likely much higher. The Trump administration has increasingly taken a harder line against the Chinese regime's human rights abuses. A growing list of officials and companies have been sanctioned for eroding Hong Kong's freedom and suppressing Uyghur Muslims in the region of Xinjiang. A major share index provider is set to remove some Chinese companies from its index products, cutting off the cash flow from U.S. investors to Chinese companies. Dow Jones became the second index provider doing this on Thursday, after FTSE Russell announced last week that it would remove eight Chinese firms from its products. Dow Jones said it would remove mainland-listed A shares, Hong Kong-listed H shares, and American depository receipts of 10 companies from all indexes on December 21st. That includes Hangzhou HK Vision Digital Technology and Semiconductor Manufacturing International Core, or SMIC. Hikvision is the world's largest surveillance camera provider and is believed to be involved in the suppression of dissidents in China, including ethnic minority Uyghurs. SMIC is China's biggest chipmaker with military use. Both U.S. index providers are acting to comply with President Trump's executive order, barring U.S. investors from buying securities of blacklisted firms. The order will take effect in November 2021. The move prevents passive investors from supporting Chinese firms with military ties. On International Human Rights Day, a group of Uyghur activists held an event in Washington, D.C., calling for the Chinese Communist regime to be labeled a criminal organization. Certain political and religious groups also attended the rally to support the Uyghurs. Stand up, America! Stand up, America! In Washington, D.C., Uyghur activists stood in front of the Capitol building to send a message to the U.S. government. They're demanding that the Chinese Communist Party be designated as a transnational criminal organization. It's International Human Rights Day. For the past 71 years since China occupied East Turkestan, our people have been deprived of all human rights and freedom. We are facing nothing less than a genocide. For decades, the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, has brutally persecuted Chinese dissidents and foreign citizens through imprisonment, torture, forced labor, and other atrocities. It has also profited off of selling organs they harvested from live prisoners of conscience, including Christians and Falun Gong practitioners. Executive Director of the Truth Warriors Alliance, Dr. Sean Lin, called out the UN for adding the CCP to the Human Rights Council and for helping it cover up its crimes. Chinese government is very good at disguising this genocide and they use the UN as a cover-up, just like they cover up the COVID-19, the disaster from China. But WHO, the UN helped covering it. And we're facing this kind of situation. Christians, Catholics and Falun Gong practitioners showed up in support of the Uyghurs. Political organizations like the Phyllis Schlafly Eagles and Stop the Steel also came to show their support. What's at stake is not an argument about philosophy. It's not an argument about uh, what you think this policy or that should be. It's about existence. It's about the existence of people. It's about life and death. It's that severe. Why is Stop the Steal here for the Uyghur? For East Turkestan? Because we need to stop the steal of their liberty. The CCP is a criminal organization. Some of the speakers at the rally said that not only should the U.S. label the CCP a criminal organization, but the whole world should as well. Don Tran, NTD News. Now we turn to an organization founded by overseas Chinese people. In honor of World Human Rights Day, celebrated December 10th, the Democracy Party of China officially launched what's called the China Torture Officials Whistleblower Center. The D.C.-based organization aims to investigate Chinese officials who persecute human rights defenders, religious believers, political dissidents and ordinary Chinese citizens. 
People can report officials guilty of human rights abuse to the center online. The center will then provide their investigation results to Western countries and related institutions across the world. And the findings can go toward holding the officials accountable to the extent of the law. Now we turn to a major U.S. university and its relationship to a Chinese educational program. Columbia University reportedly accepted $1 million to underwrite the Confucius Institute there. Confucius Institutes are part of an educational program that partners Chinese schools with those overseas. The organization is promoted as a cultural exchange, but the U.S. State Department recognized it as a propaganda apparatus of the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP. None of Columbia's Confucius Institute-related funding was reported to the U.S. Education Department. The Columbia deal was initially reported in 2011 by its student-run newspaper, The Columbia Spectator. The reports that the Confucius Institute headquarters had pledged $1 million over five years. In August, the U.S. State Department designated the Washington-based Confucius Institute's U.S. Center as a Chinese foreign mission meaning it's controlled by the Chinese regime. That center is in charge of running the Confucius Institute network in the U.S. China has set up Confucius Institutes across the world, but Colombia is the only Ivy League school to have hosted one. It's unclear if Colombia's Confucius Institute is still operating. Their last event update was posted in 2018. But Colombia isn't the only U.S. university taking funding from China. Washington's Georgetown University is facing scrutiny after receiving $10 million from a CCP-linked company. The Department of Education says Georgetown received the donation from Thai company CP Group, adding that the company has ties to the Chinese government through multi-billion dollar agreements. The university also failed to disclose the foreign gift. Congress requires all U.S. universities to report foreign gifts of $250,000 or more to the Department of Education twice a year. Georgetown student-run magazine published an article denying the allegation. The university said it would use the gift to support a new university initiative for U.S.-China dialogue. Beijing is ramping up its sanctions on Australia, but the nation isn't taking the penalties lightly and reportedly planning its own retaliation. More on the story by NTD's Don Ma. A fresh round of Australian sanctions came from Beijing this Monday. China's General Administration of Customs has suspended imports from the Australian lamb company and an Australian beef company. That's as restrictions on timber imports have also widened. These sanctions come on top of an already lengthy list. Affected goods include Australian lobster, barley, coal, wine, beef, among others, and now lamb. China says cotton, wheat, honey, and pharmaceutical producers could be next. This round of sanctions come on the heels of an accusation from Chinese state media, The Global Times. It claimed the origins of the virus came from Australia and that it was transferred into Wuhan from cold chain products. Earlier this week, Australian Trade Minister Simon Birmingham told Australian Radio 3AW that it's deeply frustrating that the Chinese regime refuses to resolve these trade disputes with Australia. He also emphasized Australia won't change its values for China. Birmingham suggests that Australia may be pursuing new trade outlets with the European Union and the UK. An expert on Chinese history, Li Yuanhua, told us that Australia may not be able to coexist with the CCP. In the past, everyone thought about a peaceful coexistence with the CCP to exchange economic benefits in silence. Today, it looks like that's impossible. Australia, in fact, is in the process of changing its views. It wants to diversify trade and open trade channels with Asian countries and the European Union. This mentality is on the rise in Australia. For decades, Australia has had a close relationship with the Chinese Communist Party. As a result, the regime had influence in many aspects of Australia's society. But their relationship took a sharp turn in 2018 and in 2020. 
In 2018, Australia passed an anti-foreign influence law that greatly impeded the CCP's infiltration. And in 2020, Australia's foreign minister called for a global investigation into the origins of the virus. The move was met with a sharp objection from the Chinese ambassador to Australia. In response, he voiced veiled threats of trade sanctions. But Australian Chinese scholar Zhang Xiaogang told us that for Australia, upholding values weigh more than economic benefits. Even though the economy is important, Australians cannot accept giving up their freedom in exchange for the economy. The CCP not allowing Australians to have their own values is impossible for anyone to accept in a democratic and free country. So the Australian people are indeed standing up these days. China's sanctions, in particular the 200% wine tariff, has drawn criticism from around the world. It has united people together to stand against the CCP. An alliance of nearly 200 lawmakers globally are calling for people to buy Australian wine for the holidays. This is Don Ma, NTD News. The U.S. Attorney's Office in Delaware is investigating Joe Biden's son Hunter for his taxes. But other allegations against him deal with the Chinese Communist Party. Joe Biden's son Hunter says he's under investigation by the U.S. Attorney's Office in Delaware. In a statement he said they're investigating his tax affairs, he says he learned this on Tuesday. Last month, two Republican senators released more details about Hunter Biden's overseas business deals. It included alleged ties to the Chinese Communist Party and the Russian government. Some of the new findings include millions of dollars sent from a Shanghai-based company with links to a firm that's effectively an extension of the Chinese regime to one of Hunter's close business associates. And there are allegations made by former Biden family business associate Tony Bobulinski in a Fox News interview. In October, Bobulinski made claims Joe Biden and his family are compromised by China. The New York Post also made allegations against Hunter of scandalous activity sourced from messages, emails, photos, and video from a laptop said to be Hunter's. It also reported an attempted meeting between Joe Biden and an advisor to Ukrainian gas from Burisma Holdings. Joe Biden has denied any knowledge about Hunter Biden's business dealings. A new campaign pressures China to release Canadians from jail. China has detained Canadian citizens for two years. That's in retaliation over Canada's arrest of Chinese tech giant Huawei's CFO. A new campaign is sending Christmas cards to Canadians detained in Chinese prisons. A group of Canadians launched the effort in December. The campaign encourages supporters to write holiday cards to Canadian diplomat Michael Kovrig and businessman Michael Spaver and mail them to Chinese embassies or consulates. The campaign also urges supporters to post photos of their cards on social media. That's to pressure the Chinese regime to release the two men. December 10th marks the second anniversary of Michael Kovrig's detention by Chinese authorities. Beijing's decision to hold them has been widely seen as retaliation. It follows the arrest of an executive from Chinese telecom giant Huawei named Meng Wanzhou. Canada arrested Meng in 2018 upon the request of the U.S. government. Meng allegedly lied to HSBC Investment Bank about Huawei's business operations, which violated U.S. sanctions on Iran. Days later, the Chinese regime took the two Canadians into custody. Beijing also denied the men consular access and bail opportunity. According to a letter he wrote to his wife, Kovrig endured poor conditions in a Beijing-area jail. On the other hand, Meng lives in one of her million-dollar mansions in Vancouver after receiving bail. Meng's legal case is set to wrap up in a Canadian courthouse in April 2021. Now we turn to feedback from our viewers. Some viewers mention the terms Asia-Pacific and Indo-Pacific in their comments. They are used by different politicians, but what is the meaning behind them? Former U.S. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson used the term Indo-Pacific region in his 2017 speech. He was referring to the countries of the Indian and Western Pacific Oceans and the wider region around them and emphasized that the U.S. will develop further cooperative relationships with three democracies, Japan, Australia and India. China affairs analyst Xia Xiaoqiang said in a 2018 interview with NTD that the Indo-Pacific region encloses China. If we use China as a coordinate, the Indo-Pacific region makes a ring around China, from India, Australia, Japan, and to the United States. 
The editor-in-chief of the Chinese Communist Party mouthpiece, Global Times, posted a video recently on the topic of Indo-Pacific. He accused the Trump administration of changing the Indo-Pacific from a geographical concept to a geopolitical concept. He urges the next administration to change the concept back to Asia-Pacific because, as he claims, the Indo-Pacific narrative divides the region and builds an anti-China alliance, whereas the Asia-Pacific indicates that China stands with other countries together. China has been avoiding the Indo-Pacific concept because Beijing takes it as America's efforts to counterplay China's growing economic and military threats. Others may not agree with the Chinese Communist regime. This November, Australia participated in the Malabar Navy Exercise 2020 after 13 years of absence. The Australian Department of Defense declared that the exercise demonstrates the deep trust among the four most powerful democratic countries in the Indo-Pacific region and shows their support of an open and prosperous Indo-Pacific vision. Germany released a 72-page policy guideline on the Indo-Pacific region this September. The document is entitled Germany, Europe, Asia, Shaping the 21st Century Together. The president of one of the leading centers for global economic research, Kiel Institute of the World Economy, said the German policy guidelines aim to connect more partners in Asia. The German Minister for Foreign Affairs Heiko Maas made an announcement right after the release, saying our prosperity and geopolitical influence in the coming decades depends on our cooperation with the Indo-Pacific region. There, more than anywhere else, will determine the future international order. The UK is making moves in the region too. British media say the UK is to deploy an aircraft carrier in the Indian Ocean next year. A growing number of countries are gathering around a free and open Indo-Pacific vision. Still, Hu Xijing warns the concept will not bring about the result that Washington elites want to see. And that's all for today's China In Focus. Thanks for watching and see you tomorrow.